<laughs> Yay. There we go. Hey Donna, how are you doing tonight? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to take part in this. It's, it's good to share the knowledge and get it out there. Oh, I'm so excited to have you and I can't thank you enough for being here. I know, like I said, we've um, we've seen you on everything from the BBC to The Guardian <laughs> to everything else. It sounds like it was a bit of a whirlwind after you actually won your case in terms of the press coverage and everything else. Yeah, I was really hoping that there would be some traction and that there would be some coverage just to kind of push the message out there that this happens all the time and you can successfully pursue claims. But um, the uptake was definitely more than what I was expecting, which is a good thing um, for raising awareness. But it, yeah, it's totally caught me off guard and it's nothing that I've ever been um, through or experienced before in terms of speaking to these people. But um, it's good, yeah. I muted myself so you wouldn't hear the ding-dongs and then I got trapped in mute. I think the reason, the reason it's captured everyone's imagination is because this is a tough thing. This is a tough thing that you did. And if I heard correctly from um, some of the other interviews you did, what made you choose to represent yourself at the beginning of this? Kind of what went through your mind as you were kind of making that decision? Well, I guess to be completely honest, I, it wasn't my preferred option. I didn't want to represent myself. So there's a charity out there who you speak about quite a bit today uh, called Pregnant and Screwed. Yes. So they essentially in the very, very early stages were my go-to reference point and who gave me a lot of really good guidance and solid information. So mm. they tipped me off about exploring legal protection which is something a lot of people tick the box for every time they renew their insurance premiums, whether it be house, car, travel, whichever, or with the, your bank. Um, and this legal protection is there actually to protect the person as well as the, the property or the car. So I did explore that, but unfortunately on two occasions, um, they declined to cover my legal costs However, they were happy for me to pay um, directly to represent me. Funny that. No, I think. <laughs> but funny that, exactly. And um, within Morrison's head office, trade unions are just not a thing that really exists or anyone ever talks about. So it was nothing, it, it was something I was never a part of. So that wasn't an option in terms of supporting me and representing me. I looked into no win, no fee solicitors, but they were very much of the um, thought and mind of uh, going down a settlement route, which inevitably would come hand in hand with a non-disclosure agreement, which I had no appetite to sign because um, I was quite, I felt quite strongly all the way along about making people aware that this happens all the time I have seen it happen to other people and I have been subjected to it and yeah. it's certainly not just in Morrison's which I think is what you were saying about the fact that it's captured people's attention and interest is because it happens so frequently I can't I've lost track of the number of people I've spoken to about my experience who have then come back to me with oh well I know this person or this happened to me or my sister or my brother everyone has a story that they can give you in ret in return so that's why I just didn't want to go down the non-disclosure route um which again I think there's a misconception that non-disclosures are this big Hollywood thing that you know movie stars are forced to sign after something horrendous has happened to them <laughs> that is not the case I know quite a number of people who have signed non-disclosure agreements for, you know, whatever reason, that is a decision that they made. But, you know, they, they are very commonplace and they're used for the wrong reasons a lot of the time. There are good reasons to have non-disclosure agreements. In my opinion, hiding discrimination is not one of them. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that is why I wouldn't go down the route of a no win, no fee solicitor. So then I was faced with either paying £300 an hour for an unknown number of hours. There was nobody could tell me how many hours my case would take. Yeah. Um, so I had two options, which was drop the claim or represent myself. Yeah. And yeah. Um, we all know what I chose. <laughs> And so I, so what I really want to do tonight for, um, for everyone who's listening, because most of the people who are listening tonight have had some interaction with Vala in the past and means that they're probably on some point of the journey that you have gone on. And what I'd love to give them is, you know, some practical kind of a practical view of what's coming or what could be coming in terms of you know, um, what was it like to navigate this process? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we could start at the point after maybe actually filing your tribunal claim. Did you get help to file that claim? How did that actually work? So that's probably one of the regrets that I have in that first stage of the process, submitting that ET1 along with your um, claim form. Um, I put together as good an ET1 as I could however it definitely could have been a lot better Mm. there could have been more detail in there there were things that I didn't include that I wished I had included some of it I was allowed to add at a later date Mm. but some of it I wasn't and it is very very difficult to add anything in at a later date there has to be a really good and solid reason Mm. Um, I also initially when I raised the claim in January of this year and submitted that first ET1 I didn't tick all the right boxes I initially raised it on the grounds of maternity discrimination not knowing that I needed to include sex discrimination as well but that came from a lack of understanding of the law and which bits of the Equality Act applied so um And then at that point, I was actually still employed, so I hadn't raised the unfair dismissal Mm. um, claim. But I guess my point is, try your very hardest. I know there is a lot going on at the point at which you're contemplating submitting an ET1, but at that point, do your very best to include everything. You know, just trawl your memory back. Think of every single bad thing that has been said happened even if it goes further back than what your claim applies to just think of it as a story setting theme um articulating to the tribunal the type of company that you're raising a claim against and then the other thing I would say at that stage and this will continue forever until the very end of your hearing is to be as succinct and clear um, and cohesive as possible generally these issues are quite emotive and you know you've been wronged but it's really really important to stay level-headed and objective and get your point across clearly um, and making it clear to the tribunal how discrimination if that is what you're pursuing applies um whilst giving all the relevant details I think it's it, it's easy to explain in really intricate detail exactly every single conversation but it's important to really filter that down mm. and how did you uh, we see this all the time when we're helping people with their ET1s um you know there's a lot of questions about um you know what's relevant and what's not relevant people you know until they kind of get into this process they really don't know what to include and what not to include and that emotional part is so massive and you see um a lot a lot of people often you know the first kind of impulse is to kind of list out everything and then often you're kind of cherry picking out of that how did you deal especially in those early stages with that emotional aspect of it and did that change over time as you kind of move through your case it definitely evolved over time I got I got more familiar I got better with um 
being able to cut through the irrelevant stuff. Mm. Um, and I don't think it's realistic to expect for any woman to know at that very first stage um, exactly what to include and what not to include. And nobody really should be expecting that ability in, in person because you don't yeah. you don't have that legal experience. I search lots of different websites. I mean, I spent hours researching. Working families is another quite useful one. They have quite a lot of templates that you can use. So I did look into that and they've got quite a lot of different scenarios on their website for different situations. Um, yeah. I also read the government's website, the outcomes of other people's cases that were similar to mine. So I really familiarized myself and got my mindset into a place where this is clearly the type of content and detail that wins a case. And then anything that didn't really align with that, I just thought irrelevant, irrelevant, just cut that bit out. So, um, so my story became clearer and clearer as time progressed. Yeah. But at the stage of the ET one, I know it's it's kind of quite contradictory, but I would include as much information as you possibly can, but at the same time keeping it relevant. Mm -hmm. And the way to keep it relevant is to familiarize yourself with what seems to succeed in the tribunal and what doesn't. Yeah. Absolutely. It's fantastic advice. And if I could just um, repeat a few parts of that for um, for all of our listeners. Uh, one thing is if you search an, on the web for employment tribunal decisions, that's where you will find the resource that Don is referring to there. It's a gov.uk page and it's called employment tribunal decisions. And that's where you can look through all of the decisions that have gone through tribunal and been published. And what you're looking for, because there's a lot of noise in there and John, Donna will know and um, what you're looking for are cases where it says full judgment or judgment with reasons and those are the ones that will give you all the details of what happened and most importantly how the tribunal made their decision so they tell you what made them decide one way or another which is in incredibly useful for research the other thing um, just on clarifying your claim and really understanding it is if you go to vala.uk and you click on the menu on the left and then choose make a tribunal claim, we've listed most of the major discrimination related tribunal claims and a few other claims there. And we specifically point to real cases on gov.uk and we talk through exactly what happened in those cases and a little bit more about the legal claim itself. So if you're in that position, that research phase, I'm sure I can get Linda to drop a link in to that make a tribunal claim page and it just lists tons of different claims and that's a great place to start. I wish it had existed when you had first started Donna, I think you, you were having to work even harder. <laughs> and, and what I would add to what you've just said there today is that Reading these documents, they're heavy, they are heavy going, mm. and eventually over time, you do become familiar with what to skim through. So don't be alarmed if you open these documents and they're 30 pages in length. Unfortunately, you become quite familiar quite quickly with, yeah, yeah, don't need that, don't need that. And you, and you get to what I would call the good stuff. Um, what another useful tip might be is you can actually search tribunal outcome decisions by company name so you can actually go and dig a bit of dirt on your employer and um, find out has anybody previous to you been successful these are excellent tips Donna this is gold this is gold for everybody who is visiting fantastic okay let's talk a little bit more specifically about running like the mechanics of running a case how long did your case go from like ET1 to um actual judgment how how long was that period so I would say I was lucky but um I don't think anybody involved in a tribunal can say that they're lucky but I would say I was lucky because it was quite quick in the world of tribunals so I got warned by various different people 
that it can take ages because like everything in the world at the moment, COVID has created a backlog. Indeed. But this hugely varies from tribunal um, location to location. So for example, Newcastle could be very different to Birmingham. Mm. London could be different to Leeds. So I raised my claim in January 22 and my hearing was October 22. That's quite unheard of. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I got told to expect anything from 18, 12 to 18 months to even two years. But fortunately for me, that wasn't the case. And the reason I say I was lucky is because despite all your great note keeping and record keeping, memories do get fuzzy over time and it is really hard to recall that information and that is important when you're being cross-examined and when you're cross-examining because you know people's memories do get foggy um I guess the bit to point out as well is in between the claim being raised in January and the hearing taking place in October I had what is quite common in discrimination claims I had a preliminary hearing and the reason why that's common in discrimination claims is because they're quite complex and they happen over long periods of time. So the tribunal service put in place what they called a preliminary hearing to kind of get both parties together um, with a judge there to whittle through exactly what it is that is being disputed and get what is called a list of issues agreed um, of course all of this I was unaware of yes until I went through it step by step so the preliminary hearing for me took place over the telephone but some people it can take place in person and it was set for March of this year but it then got moved to June because I raised an additional unfair dismissal claim Mm -hmm. And I also um, added the sex discrimination claim in. Mm -hmm. And I also <laughs> added in some extra um, issues because of the results of my DSAR, which is a data subject access request. So that uncovered um, other issues that I wasn't aware of in the January at the point at which I raised my claim. So for all of those different reasons, my preliminary hearing moved from March until to June. So um, I was really, really nervous and really anxious because although up until that point, I'd been liaising with Morrison's solicitor, I knew that that was a really fundamental point in my claim because I was going to be in front of a judge for the very first time. And more important than that, I would have to have the list of issues, which is essentially the legal framework and structure of your entire case and claim. So that made me feel really nervous. Um, prior to the preliminary hearing, you both parties have to submit an agenda for the preliminary hearing. So that is a formal document. It's, there is a template for it. Um, and there's various different sections that need populating and it's an entirely blank document when you receive it and again as a litigant in person you just look at it and think how on earth am I going to fill this out and what do I even put in all of these boxes and again this is where um, the internet can be hugely useful and um, the other thing that you get as a tip is to try to agree with the other party a, a combined agenda so that the judge isn't having to deal with two separate agendas however that's um sometimes easier said than done <laughs> however the thing to take away is for you to show willing and that's really important throughout the whole of your case to show willing with the other party so for you to be able to demonstrate to the tribunal of look at me, I'm the bigger person, I've remained the bigger person throughout this process, I have tried to work with this solicitor, but, you know, they don't want to, or they're not playing ball. Yeah. It's really important for you to be able to demonstrate that, I think. 
I think it, you get a lot of brownie points for it. And I think you come across as um, just a decent person, really, I think. Um, however, the other thing to think about is um, don't get embroiled into pettiness or disagreements with their solicitors. Um, it's difficult because they are sometimes, I would say, intentionally being awkward or not playing ball. But I guess you need to remind yourself they are there to defend every single horrible thing that your employer <laughs> did. Even if they as a person don't fundamentally agree with what your employer did, they're being paid by your employer to defend them and to defend them to the very end. So they're never really going to put their arm around you and say, let me look after you through this horribleness. I'll take you through this step by step and I'll help you. Um, so, yeah, just try to remember all of that. Um, however, if they are being really difficult and really putting barriers up, you are fully entitled to report incidents to the tribunal and it's important to have them on copy um, and a, a lot of the correspondence between you and the tribunal um, will need you to put them on copy yeah. and when I say them I mean their solicitor yeah. um, and I did do that there were a couple of times they wouldn't agree list the list of issues with me ahead of the preliminary hearing there were other things, but I tried to make those as isolated as possible so it didn't look like I was running off and telling tales all the time. Um, so getting soon back on track to the preliminary hearing, which was set for June, I, from the research that I'd done, got it into my head that this was a pretty fundamental stage in my claim and the legal basis of my claim were going to need to be fully understood. So whilst I've done a lot of groundwork and I understood a lot myself and I familiarized myself with other people's successful claims, I felt the need to get some legal assistance at that, this stage. I decided if I was going to spend any money on my case, that was probably a good time to do it. Mm -hmm. So I paid for one and a half hours of a solicitor's time to review my list of issues and validate whether they were correct or make any recommendations on where they might change the wording or make improvements. So I spent £500 on that. And um, what I didn't realise also at the beginning was that you can do something like that. You can get what they call ad hoc advice, which you'll know, Danny, but the majority of people out there when you're engaging in this, you've got no idea of how this all works and all the various different options. I assumed it was an all or nothing. You either had a solicitor for everything or you had nothing, and that's not the case. You can pay for ad hoc advice every now and again as you see fit. I guess what I would say is to just be really careful that you don't become overly reliant and dependent on that because they're not representing you they are just providing legal advice as and when you pay for it really and um, so you still need to be in complete control of everything yourself yes totally agree this oh my goodness there's like you've just said so many amazing things and uh, let me let me recap a few things for people watching um so everything that donna just mentioned there the preliminary hearing the case management agenda the list of issues um all of that um we do have templates to help you with that and as donna said there are templates available elsewhere and i'm really curious about um when so when you got that support from the external solicitor, tell me how, how did you brief them? What materials did you give them? Because this is something we think a lot about. How do we make it as simple as possible for someone who's controlling their own case to get the most bang for their buck when it comes to that ad hoc advice? So I had 
fortunately engaged with Helen Larkin, who I've referenced in other interviews. So Helen took Lizelle, the beauty brand, to tribunal herself wow. about two years ago, and she was successful. So Helen was so helpful to me. Um, and I spoke to Helen about my situation, and Helen explained to me that she had engaged a solicitor on an ad hoc basis. So she had paid a certain amount of money for support on a couple of different scenarios. And um, I th yeah, I think it was at that point that I became aware that that was an option. So Helen gave me the details of the company that she used, and I spoke to them, explained how I'd come across them, and we had some pro bono chat um, about my situation and what it was that I was wanting from them. And I think it was through those chats and just research that I'd done myself that I understood that the list of issues would probably be a useful thing for me to get support on. And they'd yeah. given me a bit of guidance to that effect they told me exactly what I needed to provide them for them to be able to review my list of issues. And by that point, Morrison's solicitors had drafted up a draft version of the list of issues. I had asked them for that repeatedly, but they waited until the very last minute to do that. But I did have, I can't remember how many weeks in advance of the preliminary hearing but a period of time before the preliminary hearing I did have their draft list of issues so the ad hoc solicitor reviewed their proposed list of issues my ET1 their ET3 I want to say yeah yeah and any really what I deemed crucial pieces of evidence yeah so she is, she reviewed all of that in that one and a half hours and the, then came back to me with, yeah, I think their list of issues have their or thereabouts covered, but you may need to think about this and you may want to include that and you may need to take into consideration that some of the decisions were made while you were pregnant, while you were on maternity leave, and after you returned from maternity leave, the different parts of the Equality Act are going to apply at different stages. Um, she gave me some tips about what, she didn't necessarily call them tricks, but I would call them tricks, um, what tricks their legal representation might try and get away with. Yeah. Um, so, that was really useful but I guess what I would also say is just like so many people I had come across throughout the whole process um, and I and I do genuinely think it comes from a good place she wasn't necessarily encouraging of me doing this on my own mm. and I do come back to the point of I don't think all of these people are doing it from a negative point of view I think the majority of them are coming at it from a this is going to be really hard this is going to be character assassination this is going to really test your resilience and mental health so I like to think that people are coming from it from that point of view but in the same breath I would also say you know, we're all grown ups. We all know what we can and can't endure and what we are able and not able to deal with. And I think that people are being done a disservice by being told, yeah, I, I really don't think you should do this or I really think you should consider pushing your legal protection again to get them to represent you. Because I think Every single time somebody says that to you, it forces you to question whether you've made the right decision. Yes. Yeah. And that's just really hard when you're going through something as tough as what an employment tribunal is. You need support. But yeah. Yeah. So I guess what I'm trying to say is they are just trying to really make sure that you are very clear how tough it can be. 
but at the same time in doing that they kind of are undermining you as well mm -hmm. yeah it's it's something that we think a lot about here at Vala because we're here to support our, our entire company exists to support people who are representing themselves and so we probably flip on the other side where we're we're always on your side we're always here to support you sometimes we might say you know you don't have to do this like that's a perfectly valid thing to do as well but i think it's so important for people to hear that they they can absolutely do this if they want to do it and they have support to do it actually i'm i'm very conscious because i know there's tons of questions going in one more question from me before we go to the audience so you joined um the vala platform relatively late in your case and um, can you just talk about kind of how you use the platform, what services you might have used and kind of at what stage you kind of onboarded with us? Of course. Yeah. So I um, found out about Vala through my pregnant and screws mentor. So she mentioned on one of our calls that there was this platform called Vala. So I went on and had a little look. And it was the timeline for me, which was really critical because in my case and in a lot of cases lots of different things happen yeah. and you need to be really crystal clear and all over the detail of what happened when it happened who said it what evidence you have to support each individual incident mm -hmm. and the valor timeline is brilliant for that and in fact, I was able to access that while I was still employed by Morrison's. So I was uploading stuff while I was at work. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and, and I think that's the key thing. So in the timeline, you've got the event, but then you can attach the evidence to the event. And it sounds like that was the crucial thing for you, yeah. where it was like, on this day, this thing happened. Here is a copy of that thing that happened. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. And um, so for me, emails were my main bit of evidence and um, so I had quite long email trails so I was able to attach the same attachment to multiple incidents on my timeline because the same email applied to lots of different incidents because um, I made lots of email trails um, and this is what's for really really important for any claim you do need to have some sort of evidence you're just going to have a much tougher time of it if you don't have that kind of evidence um, to demonstrate what did and didn't happen. Um, so it feels really uncomfortable sending those kind of emails in the workplace um, or correcting minutes that get issued, but it's really important that you do that because when push comes to shove, if you know that this is going to end up in a tribunal, you need to have that documentary evidence so it's yeah. worth the discomfort at that stage while you are still employed to Absolutely. have it documented and recorded and like you said the Bala platform lends itself for having those pieces of evidence attached and not every single incident that you will have in your timeline will have evidence for it and that you don't need it for example, mine would just be returned from mat leave on such and such a day. Mm. And then um, meeting scheduled, such as, but then other bits will have fundamentally important pieces of evidence attached to it. Yeah. And I take it that's, um, that chronology is so essential for a witness statement later on. Yeah. Critical. Um, and ET1. And the depending on what point you engage in the Valor platform, you know, if you do it early on, it can be really critical for your ET1 as well. And also when you're cross-referencing their witness statements, which you receive back. Mm. Um, and then also when you're pulling together your questions for cross-examination. I've, I've lost track of the number of times I went back to my Valor timeline. That's so exciting because that was the very first feature that we built um, for that reason. So it's so helpful to know that that is um, working as intended. OK, so I have kept you all to myself for a little bit too long. I'm conscious that there are lots of things going on in the chat. So I'm going to have a peek in here and see what kinds of questions we have. So I'm just going to scroll up. 
So Pam asks, when do you request a DSAR if you're going to tribunal and is your employer obliged to accept your request of a DSAR? Um, so at any point in time, um, you can submit a DSAR. I didn't know about it until much further down the line, but then I would argue at the same time by doing it a little bit later on, I had way more stuff to go at because that left a longer period of time for them to be doing things they shouldn't be doing and saying in emails or instant messaging or writ handwritten notes so firstly um at any point in time you could submit a DSAR secondly they are legally bound they have up to 30 days to respond and then in exceptional circumstances they can have longer but they have got to follow it up with everything and then if they are being difficult, you can report them to an organization called the ICO. Absolutely. And I would just echo, um, so we have a we have a DSAR template that you can use for free. And often what we find for people who are going to settle, um, we find that combining a settlement offer of say a without prejudice letter with a data subject access request is often quite a nice um. I'm serious kind of tactic to show your employer that you are collecting evidence for a tribunal claim and you'd like to try and avoid that by going and settling beforehand. If you do want to know more about the DSAR, um, our free template has a little course inside it which covers things like what happens if your employer doesn't respond. It's such a smart thing that you did to use that and we've seen other people use that really well. Okay, I've got another question. What tips do you have for applying to amend a claim in a written application and a preliminary hearing? Um, so I did do that because of something that came out of the DSAR that I wanted adding into my claim. Um, mm. So it was a case of emailing the tribunal with their solicitors on copy to say, to give a, a rationale as to why you're making a late change. So my rationale was, I did not know this had happened or this took place or this impacted me until I re received the results of the DSAR, which was on X date. And as a result of that, um, it forms part of maternity discrimination. So it's not a new claim. It's not something new. It's just an extra incident that happened that I didn't know about. So um, I guess my answer is be clear to the tribunal why you're doing it what the benefit for you is and um yeah that that's it really just yeah. be very clear there was someone else who asked is it too late to amend your claim at the preliminary hearing uh, the short answer is no um some of the case management agenda doc templates actually say is there anything you would like to try and amend and you can fill it in at that point was it roughly at the preliminary hearing stage that you amended your claim it was really quite close to the preliminary hearing, yes, and you're absolutely right, Janine. there's a box towards the very top of the agenda, which basically says, is there anything that's been missed off? If so, tell us about it now. Um, it's kind of like at a wedding, say it now or forever hold your peace, because after preliminary hearing, you, you can't really, it's very, very difficult. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. So, ooh, here's a good question about costs. I was going to ask if you had received a cost warning letter. Let's see. Karen asks, if you represent yourself and lose, are you then liable for the other side's costs? So tell us about your cost journey, if yeah, any. <laughs> yeah, and, and really good question, because it scared me a lot. Even during the week of the hearing, it scared me because it was still possible at that stage. So, yes, unfortunately, there is a cost risk of you having to pay the other party's costs. Now, I thought I had received a cost warning, but I didn't. What it was, well, it was in regard to the list of issues. There was something in there about the tribunal, the other party tried to tell the tribunal that they should put a 1,000 pound fee against me for, yeah. Yeah. But that wasn't a cost warning and I didn't actually ever receive a cost warning, but it was a threat I was very, very mindful of. And I got lots of reassurance from various different sources of 
cost warning to go after a litigant in person for cost is pretty unethical um and it's fairly rare it's not impossible but it's fairly rare that a tribunal would do that the main grounds for doing that is if you behave so appallingly that the tribunal just think this person is an absolute time waster nuisance they they have wasted the government's money in pursuing this claim to your claim is founded on utter lies and there is no element of truth whatsoever in what you're saying therefore again you're wasting the government's time in pursuing the claim um or three if you just don't turn up to stuff or if you don't follow and adhere to deadlines and that's one thing i would really labor we haven't covered yet it's so so important to follow every single deadline and be really on top of what deadlines the tribunal set you because at that preliminary hearing you get case management orders afterwards so on there it will be you have to exchange this on this date you have to submit this on this date and it's critical the tribunal have got zero tolerance for people not adhering and following deadlines so I would say that's very important yeah, and, and to echo, there actually was a study done of cases that was released in 2020. So in only 6% of cases were costs awarded um, to the respondent from the claimant when it was applied for. But in 26% of cases, the tribunal did award costs to the claimant. Now, it's worth both of those things that uh, Donna just mentioned there, the deposit order um, for that £1,000 and a cost um, application and cost warning, those are tactics that employers often use to intimidate employees that you yourself can use as part of a negotiating tactic as well. Um, so those uh, we have templates for those as well, because these are things that often get used only by one side. And it is worth knowing you can claim costs if the employer has done any of those things that Donna mentioned, and you would be able to bill your time towards those costs at a rate currently of about 41 pounds an hour yeah. so it's um yeah it's a scary thing we tell the same people the same thing the best way to avoid the risk of a cost warning or to really lower that risk is to engage in good faith in the process to not make up anything <laughs> and to you know research your legal claims um but they are so scary okay i've got even more questions so i'm going to start rattling through um <laughs> I was told that the judge had an obligation, this is Rachel, to step in with legal arguments for litigant in person. Do you know if the judge has a responsibility to fill in with legal representation if a person representing themselves doesn't always ask the appropriate legal question? Um, there's an element of truth in that. So the judge's responsibility is to ensure that no litigant in person is disadvantaged because of their lack of legal knowledge. So they are there to ensure everyone's on a level playing field um, they're not there to argue on your behalf, I guess is what I'm going to say. So they're not, they're not going to start quoting, oh, you've forgotten this bit. And actually this part of the Equality Act will support what you're trying to say. Um, what I, in my experience, the judges respond very well if they feel like they're dealing with someone who has tried their absolute hardest, who has researched, who has tried to familiarise themselves, who has familiarised themselves with other cases, can articulate themselves quite clearly, but understandably don't know the inner, the, 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 the absolute detail of the legal side of things. So yeah they're there to be supportive um and to step in if the other side are getting out of line but they're not going to hold your hand that's um i would completely echo that as well they're just like donna said they're not there to represent you but you can absolutely say you know i've researched this and i just need to clarify this particular thing or you've asked me to do this can you clarify what this part means they're absolutely there to help you understand what's going on, aren't they? And that's a really good point. You are fully entitled, and I would urge you at every single stage to say, I don't understand what that means. Mm. 
you know, and if anything, that reinforces your position as a litigant in person because, you know, these people that you're going to be interacting with are doing this every day, day in, day out. They are, you know, they're handling multiple cases. You're handling one case that you've never, ever done before. So you are expected to not know what is being said. And just like any of us can quite easily slip into jargon that we are familiar with on a day-to-day basis because that's our job and other people would be talking to you and wouldn't understand this jargon that's the same of you so you're entitled to say excuse as long as you do it politely and you don't talk over them you can you know you just say excuse me I don't I don't understand what you've just said yeah totally agree we have got questions running thick and fast okay I raised a grievance which was in time for my ET1 for incidents that happened in the past. When I received the ET3 form, they said the incidents were time barred. Is that correct? Yes. So I got told um, 99% of respondents will use the time issue as you're out of time, you can't claim this. And time, you know, I think this is widely shared now. Timing is imperative you have three months after the incident happened however there are ways and means of getting around that if they apply to your claim and I was able to argue them so I went I was able to argue a continuing act exactly so yeah. that that meant I could go way back because it they were all interconnected you've also got just an equitable it doesn't hurt them because they are just as able to prepare and argue for what you're claiming than if you had raised it at an earlier date, but it wouldn't be just or fair for it to be excluded for you because you would be disadvantaged. This is really legally chat, I know. Um, But there are are reasons for time to be an exception to be made, but they have to be really good, solid reasons. But to put anyone's mind at ease, every single respondent will use you out of time as a go-to response. Oh yeah, and it's very normal for a respondent to immediately file an application for strikeout um, straight after. Yeah, so it's really normal for the respondent to immediately just try and get the whole case thrown out because it's out of time and it's probably rubbish anyway. And that can really intimidate people, but it's just a tactic. Yes. Yeah, Um, all right, let's see. Can you tell me about how you conducted your cross-examination of eight witnesses? Um, I tried to get my head in the space of every legal drama I've ever watched in my life. Love it. (laughs) There's a little bit of line of duty in there as well. um, and, And then the other more serious side is I had spent hours, hours, upon hours on this I knew the details within an inch of my life so I was so so clear of what the case was what the story was what I needed to prove I had familiarized myself with other people's successful claims so I knew that I needed my story to fit with other people's successful claims to make the judge's job and the panel's job easier um and the other issue though was and I had people read over my cross-examination questions because I knew the details so much I was getting myself really bogged down um Mm. so what uh, a great piece of advice I got ahead of the hearing was make um make your questions demonstrate how they didn't even follow their own policies so rather than trying to prove every single little point that you feel aggrieved about just go for the really important really easily proven things Mm. um is is what I think was useful and to be fair the judge did give me credit for that which I was very grateful of um he said that I'd filleted the case for them so that it was just easy pickings for them to pick from. Yeah, I um, I remember seeing that when you first won and how you got such high praise from the tribunal for your um 
for your whole case construction and your cross-examination, which is just so impressive. And I, and I, I think that that just falls into what we've spoken about, which is everybody is capable of this. I am not special. I have got no legal background. But if you put the time and, and energy into it, which, you know, there's no underplaying that it does take time and energy. But if you do, and if you conduct yourself in a polite way, like you would normally in any other situation, you, you get brownie points for it, I would say. Absolutely. OK, let's see how many more we can fit in. Um, Someone said to clarify, you can amend your particulars at a preliminary. So I'll quickly answer that. You can ask to amend your particulars. The tribunal doesn't have to say yes, but asking at the preliminary hearing for an amendment and giving a reason why is a perfectly normal thing to do. Um, okay, let's see, what else have we got here? I have been told that when a grievance is underway, the employer is not obligated to disclose related documents if you submit a DSAR. Is that not correct? I'm considering a DSAR, but my grievance is underway and yet to be concluded, but I've recently still submitted my tribunal application. The only thing that they are not obliged to disclose is any correspondence between them and their solicitors. Exactly. Because that's privileged, but anything that has got your name on it that falls within the scope of what you detail in your DSAR, it's, it's, it's yours to have. Now, I have heard horror stories about employers messing around and, and not um, disclosing things, but there is a second point in time at which you should be given information, which is during disclosure, which the judge will um, timetable at the preliminary hearing. However, also they do sometimes not play ball and include things in disclosure that they should, but that's where it comes really important to start cross-referencing your DSAR documents, your evidence, their disclosure details. And it's unfortunately a game of spot the difference, but it's important um, to be able to capture them out if they are excluding things. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, so it's important to know that the DSAR part is nothing to do with employment tribunals. DSAR is part of data protection law. And so, um, as Donna said, they can only reduce, they can only um, preclude giving you information if it's legally protected or if it's someone else's personally identifiable information. But then it's um, redacted. Exactly. That will just get redacted out. And um, yeah, so that sounds like a nonsense excuse to me as well. And I agree, we see a lot of nonsense excuses when it comes to DSARs. Now, um, I'm very conscious of time, and I know we all want to get back. I've got one final question that Nicola asked. Um, was your judgment available? Is it now available to view online? Can others learn from you now? Well, so it, the outcome is available online because that happens for everyone. But the nice, juicy detail actually isn't. So the judge, although my judge was brilliant and I would say very fair, um, on the day of the outcome, he explained that the detailed stuff that we've just discussed this evening would only be uploaded and become available if either party submitted a request within 14 days of the hearing ending for that to be done. And he, he, he very much made the point of the only reason we should be doing something like that is if either of us wanted to appeal the outcome. Mm. So I got a real overriding message of don't waste the tribunal's time asking for that document to be created for no good reason. Yeah, makes sense. And um, did Morrison's, because I saw in one of the articles that they said that they were considering an appeal, have they requested a write-up? It's my, um, it's the only statement that they've released. Um, to my knowledge, they haven't. They haven't copied me in on that request. They do have 42 days in which they can submit an appeal, but in order to make the appeal, they would need to have asked for that documentary evidence 14 days after, within 14 days, sorry, which to my knowledge hasn't happened, but you know, based on my experiences so far, I, nothing would surprise me. 
So yeah, yeah, it sounds like a more of a fig leaf sort of press statement than anything else. Okay, well, there are more people, more questions that we could ask, but I'm very conscious that we have ran out of time. I cannot thank you enough for your time, Donna. Um, now, Donna is actually helping people. Um, so she's, um, I actually want to talk to you to see if we can join forces and we can work alongside Vala. Um, your new website is letstalkwork.co.uk, is that right? That's right. That's exactly right. And then there's an Instagram page as well. So basically all this information that I've got buzzing in my mind that I've splurged out this evening, I, I want to make it available to people because it was one of the things that I struggled with during my running my case was just being able to speak to somebody who wasn't a solicitor who had done what I had was doing. Yeah, and 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 that's why I want to talk to you as well because um, that's exactly what we're doing. I'd love to see if we can join forces because we have Vala coaches, and we're just expanding more as well because this is what people need. People need to know that this is possible, that you can do this. Look at Donna. As Donna said, she is incredible, but she's not superwoman. She is a person who took the time, who decided not to settle, and went forward with the case. It is possible to do it yourself. Huge congratulations to you, Donna, and thank you so much for coming with us this evening. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure. It's, it's good. <laughs> it's good to get the information out there. That's what I was saying to you, wasn't I? That um, that's why you and I and everyone else involved in this whole system is trying to give people power back. That's exactly it. That's it's so exciting. Like when you were telling your story about why you were doing this, it echoes the story of why we created Vala. It's um, just more people who go through this who don't want anyone else to have to go through it. Yeah, because as much as it's a horrible process and you wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy, if you do have the appetite to do it, then you know you just need as much help and support and positive encouragement as you can get. Oh, wonderful. Thank you.